Hi folks, I've been asked to do a mini lesson on theoretical learning objective 4.3. Just as a reminder, the learning objective is, is quite simple. It just says that you can apply the instantaneous form, the derivative form of the momentum principle in situations where there are contact interactions. So basically that means anytime things touch one another. So uh, uh, let me work out an example Actually, let's work out two examples, or at least I can start two examples to show you how that works. The first example is a mass hanging on a spring. So let's say I've got a spring here, and there's a mass dangling on that spring. What I want to do is enumerate the forces using a free body diagram. So what forces are acting on this guy? Well, the spring is stretched, so that means there's going to be an upward force from the spring, the force of the spring, of course, we know that's equal to minus the spring constant times the stretch vector, okay? And then in addition to that, it's near the surface of the Earth, so that means there's going to be a weight vector, which is going to be uh, the Earth acting on the mass. This is the spring acting on the mass, right? This is the Earth acting on the mass. So, uh, but... It's just sitting there. The thing is just dangling there in the laboratory, motionless. And so when we apply the momentum principle, what we're going to say is that the instantaneous rate of change of the momentum is equal to the net force. Well, the net force in this case is the sum of these two guys. So it's going to be the weight force plus the spring force. That's the idea. That is learning objective 4.3. But really, there's more to it if you're actually going to solve the problem because you need to break this down into x and y components in general. Now, there are no x components in this particular example, so the only components that matter are the y components. Um, this guy is in equilibrium, so the rate of change in momentum, that guy has actually got no y component at all. The weight has a negative y component equal to the mass of the block times g, and the spring has a positive y component equal to the spring constant times the stretch. So what we get out of the momentum principle is the relationship mg is equal to k sub s times s. In other words, if I knew the stretch and the mass, I could work out the spring constant. If I knew the spring constant and the stretch, I could work out the mass. There's all kinds of work you could get done using that result, but the main idea is that you understand how to write the derivative form of the momentum principle and then put in intelligent things for the various pieces, okay? So here's another example of the momentum principle. Let's say we have a, a car going around a loop-de-loop -loop at an amusement park. So the loop-de-loop -loop looks something like this. And let's say we're looking at the car as it's going halfway up one side. So there it is. And we want to apply the momentum principle at that point. So um, let me scrunch this down a little bit and scoot it over. And let's ask what the forces are acting on the car. Well, there's going to be a normal force from the track, right? That's a force acting, the track acting on the car. I'm going to neglect friction for the moment, but we also know there's going to be the earth acting down, so there's going to be a weight. That's the earth acting on the car. And if we neglect friction, that's basically all there is that's there. So we're going to write out the momentum principle in derivative form. So again, that's learning objective 4.3. dp dt is equal to the normal force plus the weight. But again, the whole point of the momentum principle is to solve problems. So I need to be able to write that in a way that I can solve a problem. So let me scoot this up a little bit. And let's talk about the x and y components of those guys. So I want to be able to break this down into x and y components. In this case, it's not a trivial breakdown. First of all, in the x direction, there is a net force, right? And um, therefore, there's a rate of change in momentum in the x direction. The guy is moving in a circle, so and that circle has some radius of curvature, r, right? So that means, according to what we learned in chapter 5, this is going to be minus mv squared over r. That'll be the perpendicular component of the rate of change of momentum. The, the guy's going up the loop-to-loop, -loop, his velocity's upward, so this is perpendicular to the momentum, so that's mv squared over r. 
Now, the normal force is the only force that has a component. It's going to be minus n. The component of the weight is 0. Now, the y component of dp dt, this is going to be the rate of change of the a parallel component. This is the rate of change of the magnitude of the momentum. So I would call this um, minus m dv dt, the speed. Or you could also write that as minus ma, where a is the magnitude of the rate of change of the velocity. It's basically uh, the acceleration, yeah? And then um, that's going to be equal to the y component of the normal force, which is 0, plus the y component of the weight, which is minus mg. So what you see is that the thing's slowing down at a rate of 9.8 meters per second squared in the y direction, but it's also changing its momentum in the x direction due to that normal force. So we get some results here. We get that mv squared of rr is equal to the normal force, and we get that the vertical component of the acceleration is just uh, has a magnitude of g. So um, that's another example. But the point is, you need to be able to write out the derivative form of the rate of change of momentum as the sum of the forces acting on the system in this case, and the car. Okay.